Hello from San Francisco. I'm Ken Bin Muller, and I'll be speaking on EUS guided vascular interventions. And my thanks to the organizing committee, especially Dr. Zabas, Suban, and Gari for their gracious invitation to participate. So EUS guided vascular intervention is really just an extension of what we're performing every day in our EUS practice. We're using the same needle, an FNA needle, but instead of aspirating, we are doing the opposite. We are injecting. So we're substituting the A for an I, and that I can stand for inject, and it can stand for uh, implant. So some of the things we can inject through the needle are sclerosants, sinoacrylate glue. We can implant a coil, and we can implant other substances such as gel foam, onyx, PVA, the list goes on. What is critical though, is that we are able to visualize our target well, and thankfully we have Doppler. So here you can see that the Doppler highlights the vessel, thanks to the Doppler flow here. And this allows us to target this vascular structure very precisely. Now you might wonder, with FNA being around for some three decades, why is it that we are only now starting to perform FNI for vascular therapy? Well, I think it has really to do with our fear of vessels. That's how we were trained, to avoid vessels. So now we're actually intentionally targeting the vessel as opposed to avoiding it. So it requires a change of mindset. Well, do we even need EUS? We are performing vascular interventions under endoscopic guidance, and we've been doing just fine. So why do we need EUS? Uh, what does it add to endoscopy? I will agree. If we're dealing with esophageal varices, these are located in the lamina propria. They are violations. We don't need EUS to visualize these varices, but it's very different for gastric varices. Gastric varices originate from the submucosa. So we may just be seeing the tip of the iceberg. In fact, it may look like a submucosal tumor on endoscopy or thickened gastric folds. So EOS does have value there. And in fact, there have been studies in the past that have shown that the detection rate for gastric varices increases significantly when we use EUS to evaluate for a gastric varices. Similarly, for an ulcer, if we see a visible vessel, yes, of course, you don't need EUS, but the vessel may actually be below the surface. So again, just to emphasize, as endoscopists, we're only looking at the surface, and now with ultrasound, we can add that additional dimension of seeing below the surface. It's not just visualizing the vessel lumen. It's the feeder vessel that I think is a major advantage, that we can see that vessel and target that feeder vessel, and we can switch on the Doppler flow to confirm that our treatment was successful. But also, very importantly, EUS guidance allows us to dissociate ourselves from our dependency on endoscopic visualization. Here you can see a gastric varix, and it was punctured under endoscopic guidance. But as soon as we made our puncture, we get a gush of blood that completely reds out our view. And so in a situation like this, if you have EUS, you can now switch to the EUS image to guide your treatment. EUS allows us to target the feeder vessel. And this is nicely illustrated in this patient with a refractory Dulafois bleed. The patient had undergone virtually every endoscopic hemostatic modality under the sun, be it clips, uh, heater probe, thermal modalities, injection, even spraying sinoacrylate over the surface. As you know, a Dulafois lesion is a feeder arterial. And here on the ultrasound, with Doppler, you can see the arterial penetrating through the gastric wall. So this video will show the targeting of this arterial 
You'll see the needle here. We turn the Doppler off for a moment, but you can see that it's nicely placed within the lumen of the Delafoy arteriole. And now we are dripping the cyanoalkylate glue into the lumen. And the glue is echogenic, so you can see it filling up the lumen. It creates also intense shadowing. So when we switch on the Doppler afterwards, we see no residual flow in the Dilofois lesion. And here endoscopically, you can see that the bleeding has stopped and the patient did not have any recurrent bleeding afterwards. Another example of targeting the feeder vessel is shown in a patient with an esophageal varix bleed, had also undergone multiple band ligations for recurrent bleeding. Here you can see the varix, the residual varix. You can see the bleed here. So rather than just try bands yet again, we switch on the Doppler, we can see the perforating vessel leading to the varices that we see. And just as you saw with the Dilofa, we are targeting the lumen of the perforating vessel and we are injecting the glue. Very echogenic and the Doppler was then negative afterwards and you can see some of the glue here extruding from the puncture site. This is a I think a very instructive study. It's a randomized controlled trial comparing endoscopic sclerotherapy and EUS guided sclerotherapy of esophageal collateral uh, veins. You can see these 50 patients were randomized and they had more than six month follow up. With EUS, the collateral vessel was uh, targeted. And in the EUS group, there were fewer and later recurrences. You can see that uh, here, the EUS group, compared to the control group, which underwent the standard endoscopic sclerotherapy treatment. And the authors found that it was the persistence of the collateral vessels that correlated with rebleeding. So it is this concept of targeting the feeder vessel that has been applied to, for the treatment of gastric varices. And Dr. Romero uh, Castro, Rafael from Seville and his group were the first to inject cyanoacrylate targeting the perforating feeder vessel in gastric varices. Now the goal here was to block the feeder to the gastric varices with lesser amounts of cyanoacrylate glue. And we'll discuss this in more detail in just a moment, but you can see that in these five patients, this was proof of concept using their standard regimen. They were able to achieve 100% hemostasis without any recurrent bleeding. So why this goal of a lesser amount of cyanoacrylate glue? Well, it's because of the dreaded complication of glue embolization or migration. It is a systemic migration. And for those of us who have been using the glue long enough, we have seen the glue embolized to virtually every organ of the body, be it the lungs, the spleen, the kidneys. If a patient has AV shunts or open foraminal valley to the brain, and it can migrate into the portal vein. You can see here the glue filling the portal vein like contrast uh, media. What about just avoiding cyanoacrylate glue altogether and just using coils? And this was similarly reported by the Seville Group in 2010, proof of concept, case report, targeting the perforator vein, so the feeder vessel with a eradication in three out of the four patients, but they required a mean of nine coils per patient and in one patient, 22 coils. So feasible, but requiring a large number of coils. A multi-center trial then was conducted in Europe comparing EOS guided coiling alone versus injection of cyanoacrylate. In the EOS uh, glue group, 19 patients, so these were actually two thirds of the patients. They targeted the feeder and used a mean of 1.5 milliliters per patient. In the EUS coil group, 11 patients, so the remaining a third or so, targeting the feeder and used a mean of six coils uh, per a patient. Now what they found, and this I think is striking, there was evidence of lung emboli 
in nearly 50% of the patients, half of the patients on CT scans that were obtained after the procedure. Whereas if they used uh, coils, uh, they did not see any lung emboli. Now, is it just the coils though? What's interesting is that 18% of the patients who had coils to start still needed glue. And even in these patients who had additional glue injection, no lung embolization was uh, seen. So this raises the question, can we avoid systemic migration embolization by placing a coil before injecting the glue? The coil would fill and reduce the flow in the varix, so it would reduce the probability of the glue flowing away into the systemic bloodstream. But more importantly, the coil with its woolly strands serves as a scaffold to retain the glue at the injection site. So here you can see such a typical coil extruded from an FNA needle. And this is a ex vivo proof of concept. You can see that in this jar of heparinized blood, we first uh, placed a coil, then we injected glue. And you can see that the glue is adherent to the coil. And there was no residual glue seen in the uh, container, raising at least the possibility that all of the glue can be retained at the site of injection. This here is a, a video showing a very large gastric varix. It's in the fundus and with EUS, Doppler confirms the blood flow and we are puncturing uh, the varix with a 19 gauge needle and we are deploying a 20 millimeter coil, that's the largest coil that we have available, into the varix. You can see the coil coiling up inside of the varix lumen and we follow that immediately with an injection of cyanoacrylate. I'm currently actually placing uh, at least two coils before the cyanoacrylate for such large varices. And here at nine month follow-up, you can see that the gastric varices are obliterated comparing before and uh, after. We publish our results in a large cohort of uh, patients, uh, 152 patients over a six year period. We had high technical success rates. Our rebleeding rate was 16%, whereby only half of these patients had bleeding from gastric varices, so 8%. Adverse events in 7%. One patient developed a pulmonary embolus, but this was one week after the glue injection procedure. And the patient had been discharged home and was completely asymptomatic. So we are finally starting to see some well-designed uh, trials investigating the value of an EUS guided hybrid approach using coil and glue. Now this is still a small study, but I think it adds a significant insight here. And it's uh, from Brazil and it is a pilot randomized controlled trial. Patients randomized to EUS guided coil and glue versus conventional treatment using only glue. These 32 patients were equally divided in the two groups. Thrombosis rates were about the same, but the rate of pulmonary embolus was half in those patients undergoing the coil and glue compared to only glue. This did not reach statistical significance, but I think this could very well be a type two error. Now this is a meta-analysis in general, uh, as a rule, I don't like meta-analyses, but in this case, we have a large N, so I'm going to mention this. And this is comparing EUS guided versus conventional glue injection. And we have 23 studies using all EUS modalities. So it's not just glue, it's maybe a hybrid approach as well, or just with coil, 851 patients versus endoscopy guided 28 studies almost 3,500 patients. And this found a statistically uh, significant superiority of the EUS guided approach in terms of recurrence of gastric varices. So 9.1% versus 18%. Uh, 
This meta-analysis also then broke down the patients receiving EUS guidance to glue alone versus coil alone versus glue and coil, so hybrid. And these are 23 studies, 851 patients. And here also, they found that the recurrence rate of the gastric varices was significantly uh, lower when using a EUS coil and glue approach compared to using only EUS guided glue. So this suggests that the hybrid approach is uh, superior. The late rebleeding rate was also significantly lower in patients receiving the hybrid approach compared to glue alone. The mortality rate, the all cause, was significantly lower in using the hybrid approach compared to EUS guided glue alone. This study randomized patients to EUS guided coil and glue, the hybrid approach, versus just coils alone. So this is from Ecuador. And here you can see when they used only coils, the cumulative incidence of re-intervention was significantly higher compared to when they used the uh, hybrid approach. The re-bleeding rate was significantly lower with the hybrid approach. The varix reappearance rate significantly lower. The re-intervention free time significantly lower, and as mentioned, the re-intervention rate also lower. So I'd like to spend the last uh, few minutes touching on EUS-guided portoangiotherapy. The advantage of EUS over percutaneous access is that we have direct access to the portal vein. Radiologists do not have that direct access. And these are two applications that right now are under investigation. The first being portal injection chemotherapy. It's the acronym is EPIC. And the second would be creation of an a EUS guided portal systemic shunt or TIPS. So these are uh, data uh, that are currently only available uh, in the animal model. The goal is to optimize the liver level of chemotherapy and minimize systemic levels, i.e. the toxicity. The authors evaluated paclitaxel, doxyrubicin, and irinotecan. And what they found was that by injecting directly EOS guided into the portal vein, they could increase the hepatic levels 1.6 fold and decrease the systemic levels 1.3 fold. Irenotecan, 1.7 fold increase and a 50% decrease in systemic levels. Doxorubicin was really impressive, an increase of the hepatic levels uh, five fold with a systemic decrease of 474 fold and 31 fold for cardiac levels, which obviously is important for doxorubicin due to the uh, cardiac toxicity. I'll just mention the EOS guided portal systemic sh uh, shunt, which has some conceptual advantages. We can directly access the liver vessels from the stomach, as you can uh, see here, same way that we're using this now to perform EOS guided uh, ERCP. This is ultrasound guided versus fluoroscopy guided. And we can combine this, of course, with other endoscopic treatments such as glue injection or coil and glue. In earlier studies, used a tubular metal stent to create the tips. Now we're using lumen opposing uh, metal stents. And here is some uh, work that I did. You can see the needle traversing the IVC and entering into the portal vein here. Then we deploy the distal flange of the lambs in the portal vein and the proximal flange here in the IVC. And this is now our tips. And you can see here the IVC and the portal vein with the lambs connecting the vascular uh, lumens. So what does the future hold? This is all still investigational. Epic portal injection chemotherapy. Very exciting and very promising. EUS guided portal systemic shunt still in its infancy, only animal studies so far. Infusion portal vein thrombolysis. This actually has been reported in uh, patients. Uh, so we look forward to more on this and coil embolization for liver lobe hypertrophy. This also uh, has been reported uh, in patients. 
So again, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to contribute.